All right, so I have to ask, I have to ask, who here is going to be cheering for the Kansas City Chiefs? What? I, all right, who's going to be cheering for the 49ers? All right, so a lot more 49ers fans um, or anti-Taylor Swift fans. We're not sure what, but um, Susie and I lived in Kansas City for uh, about two, a little over two years, so I'm going to be cheering for the Kansas City Chiefs. But, uh, you know, when you kind of, when you think about football, uh, everybody has a part to play. Right, the, the 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 defense, the defense, they have a part to play. The offense, they have their part. They ha- you have you know the quarterback, you have your wide receivers, you have your tight ends, and everyone, if you're going to be successful, has their part to play. If all of the players, you know, decided to run down and be wide receivers, that poor quarterback would you know get demolished. Like he, like he he probably would quit. Be like, I'm done. I want to go to a team where I have some blockers. But if everybody blocked, then the quarterback wouldn't have anybody to throw to, right? Right. So like everybody has their, um, has, a, has a part to play, right, Caleb? And, and if, oh, good catch. <laughs> and, and so everybody has a part to play. And if you don't play your part, especially when it comes to football, then you're going to be in trouble. And here's the thing, when it comes to your family, everybody has a part to play in your family as well, right? Moms, you have a part to play. Dads, you have a part to play. Kids, believe it or not, you have a part to play. Now, here's the thing is we all don't always like our parts sometimes, right? There's parts, there's, there's different um, um, uh, parts of our, um, you know, jobs or things where we bring value to the family where we might not be like, mm, I, I don't really like this um, particular part of my um, duty. And so one of the things that, you know, we have our kids do that they just absolutely love and look forward to is um, emptying and, and refilling the dishwasher. They just, they jump up and they're like, yes, we love this. No, I'm just, I'm being very sarcastic. You know, and, and they don't look forward, and, and sometimes, not all, and not every night, but sometimes we'll cook, you know, a dinner and kind of make it, and then ask the girls, hey, can you clean up? Not just, you know, the dishes, but kind of clean up. Your mom spent, you know, 45 minutes, you know, uh, getting everything ready, and she doesn't want to spend another 45 minutes, you know, cleaning it up. And so, you know, uh, we'll, sometimes we'll just have the girls do it. But then sometimes we'll be like, you know what, hey, let's all do it as a family, and we, four of us do it, and it gets done in like a quarter quarter of the time. And everyone has their part. Everyone has their role to play. You see, we need strong families. Amen? We need strong families um, because it's strong families that are going to change the world. And it doesn't matter what your family looks like. Right now, you might just be a husband and a wife. Rob, you might be a single mom, you might be a single dad, that whatever your family looks like, God is going to give you supernatural wisdom and strength for your role, for your part. And, and so you need to look at what is God, what is the part that God has given me? And depending upon the season of life, depending upon what your family looks like right now, that role may change. That role may evolve. That, that role as your kids grow, that role is going to change. But every, every family member has a part to play. And let me tell you, the family is under attack. And, and why is the family under attack? It's because the enemy knows that strong families are a threat to the kingdom of hell. Strong families are, are a threat to the kingdom. So that's why you're seeing at every turn um, the enemy attack families. They want to break apart the family unit. They want to do everything they can to separate kids from their families, um, parents separate. They're doing everything they can to attack families because the enemy knows strong families will change the world. And the Bible tells us that how do we get strong families? We get strong families by training up our kids. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, it says this, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child. Are you training up your children in the way that they should go? Mom and dad, your role is to be an example of a man or a woman of God. What does that look like? Because they are going to model what they see from you. 
And they're going to model um, uh, what they see you do, the decisions that, you, that they see you make. Are you talking to your kids about God and his word? Are you talking about who Jesus is to you and how God's changed your life? Are you training up your kids in the way that they should go? You don't need to, and here's the thing, parents, is sometimes we feel like you need to be a theologian to talk to your kids about Jesus. Let me tell you, that's a lie from the enemy. You don't need to be a theologian and understand the Bible and every verse and the Greek and the history. You don't, need, you don't need to have all that understanding to talk to your kids about Jesus. You just need to open the Word of God, pray, and there's a lot of devotionals. There's a lot of material online that you can, that you can get. But, man, just start talking to your kids about Jesus and how he's changed your life life. And parents, we need to make sure that we're playing the role that God has called us to play as parents and training up um, our kids in the way that they should go. And, and as, as you grow, as your, as your kids get older, as I said, those, those um, roles are going to change and, and your role as a parent changes as your kids go from, you know, newborns to toddlers to school age to teenagers. Like, like your role is going to change, but um, we need to make sure that we're training up our kids, and that we're doing our part. And, and kids, that you're doing your part. You know what? Nobody likes chores, right, kids? Anybody, like, excited when your parents ask you to do chores? Not many um, are going to be excited. It's been kind of nice lately for us and our family. Uh, Addie got her license uh, a few months ago, and so now, I think it was last week, we were like, oh, we, need, we were missing some ingredient, and Susie was getting ready to go to the grocery store. I'm like, no, Addie, can you go to the grocery store? And Susie She's like, oh, this is amazing. She's like, Addie can go to the grocery store for me, right? And, and so it kind of shifts and, and, it, and it changes. Um, I, and then um, last week, um, Addie took Ivy to piano lessons. And, and so it just kind of, you know, shifts and change as you get older. And, uh, and, the, and the way that, you know, you are, your role, one of the roles that Ivy has is she stocks the fridge with, you know, soda or drinks or whatever, you know, whatever Susie's bought for that week. And, and, and so, you know, kids, you need to play your part too. You know, those chores that your parents are having you do, it's not because they want your life to be miserable. All right, kids? That's not it. That's because they want to train you. They, they want you to be, um, be able to uh, live on your own one day. And you might be small and be thinking, well, I'm five, Pastor Mike. I'm not living on my own anytime soon. Well, it starts when you're young. They want to teach you responsibility. They want to teach you so that you can learn how to, you know, uh, eventually take care of yourself. But it starts with small little doses. So kids just know your parents aren't trying to make your life miserable. <laughs> they love you and they're just trying to train you. And parents, I think that you're doing a good service to your kids when you do have them take some um, responsibility, have some chores, have some things that, that they need to be responsible for. And here's the thing, parents, when you raise your kids with godly principles, man, you win. Your, your family wins when you raise your kids with godly principles, godly morals, and you invest in them and you love them, you will win. Amen, church? Amen. All right, can you welcome back? Um, Bree is going to be coming up and sharing a little bit um, more with us. Can we welcome Bree back up? Hi, guys. My name is Miss Bree. For those of you who do not know me, I am one of the many faces that your kids get to see on the weekend throughout the month. I have a huge privilege of being able to teach them. They are amazing kids. I promise you they are very well behaved when they are in kids' church. Today, I want to talk about the power of praying as a family unit. So first, I want to know, um, for the kids in the room, do you guys have any special night routines that you do with your parents? Give me a hands up if you do. Yeah? Maybe it's you take a bath or you read a story at night. Yeah? Awesome. So when I was growing up, I had a routine that I did with my dad every single night. Every single night, my dad would help me brush my teeth, get ready for bed, and then he would pray for me before I went to bed. Every single night until I was probably around 10, I think, my dad would pray the same prayer over me every single night. And now when I look back at that, I'm 23 now, so it's been several years, over 10 years since he did that, but it still is something that is ingrained in my mind and still carries me through my life. It was something that was super important and meant a lot to me. So I want to talk to both parents and children in the room today about the power of praying. Parents, you may think, you know, I, if I pray the way I want, if I pray in the Holy Spirit, then it's going to go over my kid's head. Kids, you may think, 
I don't know how to pray. My parents are way better prayers than I am, so if I pray in front of my parents, I'm gonna be really embarrassed. But something that we talk about in kids' church often is that prayer is simply talking to God. And that goes for every single age, every single person. Prayer is talking to God. As a family, you can pray together. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be super simple. You can talk to God about how your day was. You can talk about what you might be struggling with. Maybe you haven't forgiven somebody in your family. Maybe you're holding a grudge against them. You can talk about that as a family together and then pray to God about it. When we pray together as a family unit, we are walking into the battle against the enemy together. We are walking into a battle all together, united, and we will win. When we have Christ in the forefront of our families, we are not empty-handed, but fully equipped through the power of Christ. We are united, and it's way easier to overcome temptations or frustrations when we are all together, when we can pray about things that we may be going through. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. When we teach our children how to pray, we are setting them up for success in their Christian walks. The verse that Pastor Mike just said, you know, it says that whatever we train our children in, they will grow up in. Whatever we teach our kids about Christ, they're going to remember through their lives. They're going to carry it with them. And for me personally, my dad praying over me every single night when I was a kid meant something. And it has taken, taken, sorry, it has stayed with me my whole entire life. And I just want to encourage you guys that when you are talking to your kids, it doesn't have to be complicated. You can tell your kids and confess to them even what you are struggling with. And let me tell you, when you confess as an adult to your children what you are struggling with, it is going to humanize you so much. Because sometimes our kids think, you know, adults or parents are high and mighty. They don't make mistakes. But the truth is, we are all sinners. We all make mistakes and we all need God's love. And when your kids know that and they know that you are also working on yourself and you also need Jesus, it'll change your whole family dynamic. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for this time. Lord, I thank you for every single kid and parent in this room. And Lord, I just pray that you will just give them the confidence to turn to you, God, in their struggles, in their joys, God, and everything in their lives, that they will be able to talk to you all together so that they may be equipped to walk through every hard season, God, that they will be equipped to just know your word, God, and that you will be able to guide them in every path of their life. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. What's up? I'm Pastor Caleb. I'm the youth youth guy around here. So if you don't know me, I work with youth and young adults. So um, if you don't have a youth or a young adult, well, then you don't get to work with me. But my name is Pastor Caleb. I'm the youth pastor and young adults pastor. Today I'm talking about open communication. Open communication. Now most of us, when I say open communication, they're like, oh my gosh. When I was living with my parents... My parents would always tell me, man, we need to focus on open communication. And I would be like, why do I want to openly communicate with you if you don't want to openly communicate with me? And so they would expect me to be openly communicative, but then they're like, well, we're talking about adult things. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Well, so that, that tears me apart with this open, open communication. But it's funny, I saw, this, I, th- I saw this thing on Instagram, and it was an interview with Joe Montana. Did you know he called his wife during away games? He would pick up the sideline phone, and one game he just tried it. He was like, okay, well, for outgoing calls, you need to push nine, and then, then you push the number. So he pushed, he picked up the phone, pushed nine, and there was a dial tone. And so he was like, well, I've made it this far. So I'm just going to see if I can call my wife from this away game. So he called her and she picked up and she was like, hello. And he was like, hey, it's me. And she's like, aren't you playing a football game right now? He's like, yeah, I just wanted to call and say hi and I love you. Can you imagine having the communication in a relationship where you cannot go a full day or even a few hours without talking to your spouse or family? Joe Montana loved his wife. And that's why he felt this, like when she wouldn't travel with him, man, I need to talk to her. So he would call her on the sideline, and she was just so flabbergasted by this thing, but she called her, he called her every single away game, every away game that would allow him to call out, he would call her, and he would say, hey, just wanted to let you know, I love you. 
But my mom, me and my mom were best friends growing up. We were best friends. I would tell her everything until a certain point when I got like a little bit older and I was like, okay, well, like it's super unhealthy for me to tell you everything. Like now, now that I'm married, I should not tell my mom all my marital secrets. I, w- I shouldn't tell her every single event that happens in our marriage, but sometimes they get caught and I call my mom and I'm like, hey, can I just ask you this question? And most of the time, Bree's going to nod her head no and say that this doesn't happen. Most of the time she does side with Bree. And I'm like, bro, <laughs> I'm your child. Like, we're more connected than you and Bree. But she does side with Bree most of the time. But man, I would tell my mom everything. And it's so crazy that we can look at this open communication with our family and think, man, what does it talk about open communication in the Bible? There's no verse that says, if you openly communicate, you will have a healthy family life. Well, Jesus was a very bold communicator. Jesus did not beat around the bush. Jesus was a straight shooter. Now, in Luke 22, 21 through 22, it says, But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me at this table. For the Son of Man goes and has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. So these disciples gave up everything to follow Jesus. Everything. They followed him. They quit their jobs. They left everything and followed Jesus completely. Followed his mission. And then Jesus, after this long time, was like, hey, One of you is going to betray me. It's like you sitting down with your besties at at a table, and you know there's a more popular bestie. We all know who it is. And that popular bestie says, hey, one of you told Luke that I like them. Why did you betray me? And everyone's like, "Ah, I would never betray your trust like that. But Jesus sat with his disciples and said, man, one of you is going to betray me. He did not say, hey, I think one of you is going to betray me or... Maybe one day one of you is going to betray me. No, he straight shot and told everybody, man, this is what's going to happen and one of you is going to do it. He was openly communicating with everyone exactly what was going to happen. This is how a family unit is supposed to be. We're supposed to challenge each other. We're supposed to talk about everything together. And man, even as parents or even as children, we need to challenge each other. We need to tell everyone everything. If we have a problem, we need to tell that person in our family, especially because we can start having grudges with our family and that can tear a family unit apart. But it starts with this idea of walking on eggshells in our own houses. Man, that's crazy to me. Sometimes I, I, when I'm talking to Bree, I'm like, oh man, I hit a nerve. So I like walk into the kitchen and I'm like, okay, did she catch me in here? But It's when this idea of when we walk on eggshells in our house and we don't confront the other person, man, maybe I made a mistake or maybe you made a mistake, but we need to openly communicate together so we don't tear our family apart by not communicating with each other. We need to learn to set set aside our feelings and take control of our family communication. Parents, I'm going to give you, if you are a parent of a teenager, I'm going to tell you how to communicate with your teenager. You ready? You ready? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did that really happen? Man, I didn't like them either. It's listening. Listening to your teenagers is going to get you far more than trying to talk at them. And same with children. When your parent is maybe confronting you or maybe disciplining you, Maybe you did something wrong and you know you did something wrong and you run into your room, lock the door, and your parents come knocking and you're like, I am not opening this door. I can live in here. I've got Cheetos for days. (laughs) But we need to learn that even on the parental side of things, that they're not out to get us. Our parents are there to try to challenge us and to grow us. And they do that by communicating with us. When we allow open communication to come with heavy amounts of grace rather than discipline, that's when love starts to grow. When we start a conversation and we already have the end game in mind that we're already leading towards discipline, then you've lost them. If we start leading with conversation with hatred, man, we've already lost them. We need to understand that when we start conversations with the end game of love, understanding, and grace— That's when communication will start to flow in your household, flow in our households. Because we all want to be that family in a movie that everyone's best friends and they all live in the same house together. And then when they get married, they just buy the house next to each other. Well, it doesn't start by this idea of when we start growing up that we need to challenge our kids every single moment. 
that disciplining is the most important thing in our household. That they may not love us all the time, but when they grow up, they will always thank us. Man, I can tell you right now, if my mom was watching, man, I, I learned from the time that she loved me rather than disciplined me. And that's how we need to grow together. In Ephesians 31 through 32, it says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God Christ forgave you. A forgiving house is a loving house. And we can start with the small conversations. We can start with little things, maybe stuff that happened throughout their day, or maybe you didn't put away the dishes, or maybe, maybe you as a parent just forgot and forgot your kid at the school and didn't pick them up from their practice because you didn't have it in your calendar. But we can start by apologizing can, and maybe admitting that you're wrong, even from the top to the bottom. But when we learn to openly communicate and forgive with the small things, then the big things come coming. Because then we feel a comfortable, safe place in our household. Because in 360 accountability, it starts from the top being accountable to the bottom, the bottom being accountable to the top, and us all working together for the betterment of open communication in a family unit that is strong, loving, and filled with grace. If you want to... Amen. Let's give Pastor Caleb a great big hand. If I could have the worship team come on back up. You know, when it comes to family matters, when it comes to parents and kids and all of these different relationships, the most important one is the relationship that we have with Jesus. It's the most important one. And out of that relationship, everything else will flow. Amen, parents? How many of you can say that's true? Amen. I love what Pastor Caleb shared and what Bree shared, that it takes us to lead in humility. As parents, to be willing to say, to own up to our mistakes, to own up, to say, hey, yeah, I, I was too harsh with you in that situation. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Hey, I overreacted, you know, when you, when you told me what was going on or I walked in and the kitchen was a mess and I had just cleaned it. I, I overreacted. Oh, honey, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have yelled. I shouldn't have said those things. Will you forgive me? Forgiveness is at the heart of our relationship with Jesus. So it would make sense that forgiveness is going to be an important component in our own family relationships, doesn't it? And so this morning, we just thought it was so fitting to conclude our family service today by having a time of communion together. And you might be wondering, maybe for the kids that are here, is it okay for me to take communion? I'm going to give that responsibility to every parent that's here. We basically want to just want you to know that if your child is old enough to understand the concept of sin in Jesus' forgiveness in their life, then they're old enough to partake in communion. But communion is a holy time. It's a sacred time. It's a, a time that we realign ourselves with who Jesus is, a time that we humble ourselves, a time that we ask for forgiveness from Him. And so on the tables in front of you, you'll find a communion cup if you're sitting here. If you're in a chair, you'll find it in the chair in front of you. But if you would just take that and open up the, the little wafer that holds the bread and just hold that in your hand for a moment, just for a second. You know, the Bible talks about the body and how we are part of the body. First Corinthians chapter 12 says that there are many parts to the body and each part, body, each part has its own part to play. And so when Jesus died on a cross, when he came to earth and he allowed God to be put into flesh, and then he allowed that flesh to be crucified on a cross, how many of you know it wasn't nails that had held him to the cross that day? It was simply his love for you and for me. That he allowed his body to be pierced, that he allowed his body to be beaten, not because he had done anything wrong, but solely for our transgressions, for our sins. And that's why we take communion today. We take this little wafer simply as the body of Christ, a symbol, Luke chapter 22, verses 19 to 20 says, and he took bread, he gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you, do this 
in remembrance for me. As you're with your families, maybe you want to slide in a little closer to them today. But as a family today, can we just break the bread together and let's take it in Jesus' name. You can take the cup and peel off the little cover over the juice here. Verse 20 says, In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's drink together. Would you stand to your feet all across this place? And we're going to close by singing the blessing. And as we do, I just want to encourage you, parents, would you just grab the hand of your children or put your hand on their shoulder? But let's, as a family unit, begin to pray and declare the blessing of God this morning. And then we'll be back in just a moment to close.